going on y'all hope everybody is well uh see a few names in here early what's up uneducated lane what's up brother damon malik malika what's happening the good dr bgs let's see here what's up gregory uh got cornelius in here what's happening henry yeah, set it in the West. Uh, Neo, I believe. Aquatechie, what's up? Let's see. I think I've been yeah. lack set it in the West. Been lacking on uh, some of these wrenches for quite a while now. But uh, let me try and get that. What's up, Artisan? What's happening? Taylor, Yoga, what's up? Donnie, what's the word? Yeah. Thanks for the support, Blackfoot. Appreciate that. Smooth Groove, what's up? Alex, uh, welcome. First time. Brother Eric. All right. Uh, coming out from Charlotte. That's what's up. Um, Gigi, what's the word? If y'all haven't checked it out, uh, go check out the recent, uh, well, check out all of Gigi's work, but definitely check out our recent collaboration on his channel. Uh, we're in epic fashion as usual. He tore it down. Uh, so check out Green Gorilla if you're not familiar. What's up, show me? Uh, greets with fire. Barry. Micah, what's going on? Let me uh, try and catch up on some of these, uh, uh, these wrenches in here. It's not something I thought about in a while, but I'm like, man, I am lacking. Uh, what's up, Joe? see here uh, Cleveland what's the word oh, Mike I appreciate that support man um try and get some of these in before we dive in let's see here Valeri Ishmael I think I, I hope I didn't mispronounce that what's going on um Appreciate that, brother Rashad, brother Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. That's what's up. Uh, Javon, or Javon, I pre uh, get a few of you in here. All right. Let's see some of my regulars in here. All right. All right. So y'all know what it is, right? Uh, Onyx Report, Black Masculinist. Uh, Kind of uh, yeah. appreciate that, brother Barry. Uh, black masculinist news, but um, y'all know what it is. Well, the honest report is where we, as black male justice advocates, uh, use critical analysis to uplift black men and boys. Brother Winston, what's happening? Uh, let me hook that up. All right, okay. But before we get started, let me go ahead and acknowledge um, some of y'all who've been supporting me for a uh, while now. Let me now go ahead and uh, shout y'all out. Now, uh, y'all know how it is and what we got to do before we dive in. Please make sure you support the channel. Like the video, please. Go ahead and click the like button. Let's start us off right. Share, uh, subscribe, 
join, uh, become a member of the channel, you can do that on YouTube by clicking the join button right next to the subscribe button and choosing your level of membership um, and the perks that come with that. Or you can go to Patreon and support the show that way um, and become a regular support, monthly supporter. Or you can become a monthly supporter of the Institute for Black Male Studies through Patreon as well. Uh, you guys know I recently started an Institute for Black Male Studies uh, YouTube page um, where I post for now um, oral history interviews with black men whose work um, is about black men and boys. Um, so right now we have the latest um, interview from is, is these. I mean, this was from before, but I had only posted it on the Institute website. So now I'm sharing some of those interviews on the YouTube site. And right now uh, we have the uh, interview with Kevin Samuels that's up there. Um, but also the likes of uh, some of our your YouTube favorites. You know, of course, we got Valdez, the angry man on there. We got um, Obsidian, Mumia Obsidian Ali. We got uh, uh, O'Shea Duke Jackson, a uh, number of others, uh, some of whom are brothers that I've known for a while and some I'm meeting for the first time. Some are professors, some are professionals, some are uh, our YouTube, com you know, uh, content creators. They come from all walks. And that's the point, right? Uh, really acknowledging the work of black men from all walks of life. What, you know, whether I agree with everything or not is not the point. The point is, what is their work regarding black men? and Why is it important? And how did they come upon doing that work? And that's what that channel is really about for right now. It's about, you know, kind of foregrounding um, black men's efforts to uplift black men, most particularly. Right. So go ahead and check that channel out uh, if you haven't already. Uh, and I'll probably be posting something very soon on there. Um, nevertheless, uh, so we've got a few more in here. What's up, Hybrid? Good to see you. So, yeah, make sure you support the channel. Again, um, donate. I'm going to put in the comment section the easiest ways to go ahead and support uh, the Cash App, PayPal, and Patreon, and Venmo. Um, please make sure you do so. All right. All right, so um, y'all know what it is. We celebrate black men over here. And so considering that we do so, I start with the Sacred Black Masculine series, right? And this is something that I generally do. I haven't done it recently, but I used to, I pretty much do uh, weekly. And it's kind of organic. It depends on what kind of runs across my desk, but it is an acknowledgement of black men who are doing something uh, exceptional but sacred, meaning that uh, it is something that generally gets overlooked by, in any large fashion, but uh, definitely speaks to the qualities of black men that are most downplayed, especially in uh, traditional mainstream media. So that being said, let me go ahead and uh, let's look at who we are celebrating today. All right. Well, shout out to these two brothers here. Birmingham police officers, Evan and Burnett, or Burnett pull up at the 15th Avenue North and 28th Street in Norwood last night to discover a vehicle completely submerged in floodwaters. That is the title you can find on the spotonalabama.com website. Uh, and so it reads, uh, Birmingham police officers, you know, pulled up, they spotted a, a car submerged in floodwaters, dove in to see if anyone was in the vehicle. At that time, BFRS had arrived on a call of a water rescue and discovered two Birmingham police officers swimming from the car with a woman who was about 80 years old. When they pulled her to dry land, she had no pulse and was not breathing. Let's see here. This is a, there we go. All right. Um, says she was not breathing. Uh, they quickly provided her CPR. After two rounds of it, she began coughing up water. As the BFRS team continued to work with her, her, her pulse restored. By the time they had her on the way to UAB, she was conscious and talking with the medics. So shout out to these two brothers um, who saved a, a woman who was about to drown in her car. Right? As Jerome said the rain was no joke that day. Real talk, you know. But again, um, you know, that is not, uh, I don't know if that's something everybody would have done. Dive into some water just to see if somebody was in the car. That's the deal. So shout out to those two brothers for that. Uh, what's up, Jerome? I'll uh, see you in there. All right. Let's see, Artisan, we gotta we gotta talk, Artisan. I'm going to see Halloween this week. As I get your insight on it, brother, as usual. And I am way behind on some of the the, the issues y'all have been covering lately. 
But if you haven't, definitely check out Artisan MC. He's been given, uh, doing a lot more weekly uploads. Um, and, and of course, Sunday is his big review day. Uh, so go ahead and support him and his channel. Um, <laughs> Aquatech, he said he used the wrench responsibility. <laughs> you were the privilege responsibly. All right. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, what's up, Larry? All right. So <laughs> getting to it. <laughs> We're going to do some special shout outs uh, today. All right. And we will start with this brother here. Some of you may be familiar uh, with him. All right. And this is entitled, you can find this on blackdoctor.org. HBO Oz actor passes away at 58 from cancer. All right. Actor Granville Adams, who portrayed Zaheer Arif in HBO's Oz for six seasons, Died after a battle with cancer at the age of 58. The news was confirmed on Sunday by multiple friends, including Oz's showrunner slash executive producer Tom Fantana and co-stars Kirk Acevedo and Harold Perrineau. Um, Acevedo says, I lost my brother today after a long battle with cancer. I don't do well with loss because I'm unfamiliar with it. Yo, Granny will be chopping it up on the other side one day. Until then, rest easy, my friend. Uh, Perino states, you can't always cry. Sometimes you got to celebrate the time you had together. Brittany and I love this man and the entire group of family and friends that we all created. Sleep well, Prince. We'll see you on the other side. Adams documented his battle on social media with his last post shared from what appears to be his hospital room in August. He posted 135 pounds of post-radiation badness. Uh, on his official Instagram, friends and family posted this message. Today, our beloved Granville Adams has passed and is now with God after a long, hard fought battle with cancer. Granny has ascended to the heavens. Grand spent his last days surrounded by his loved ones, family and close friends. Uh, his wife, Christina, was by his side the entire time and was alone with him when he passed. Right. Um, goodness, man, there's too many brothers going down. Damn. Um, Let's see. It says before he shot uh, to fame on a, on the HBO drama, Granville had a recurring role uh, of Officer J Jeff Westby on the NBC series Homicide Life on the Street uh, from '96 to '99. He later reprised the role in the big screen version Homicide: The Movie. Following news of Granville's death, his fellow Oz star Dean Winters posted a tribute on Instagram. It says he never ever spoke ill of anyone, and I defy anyone who knew him to say anything negative about this man. Granville was beloved, period, Winters wrote. He may as well have had people throwing rose petals at his feet while he walked down the street. A humble, beautiful soul who just elevated the afterlife to a whole new level. You will be missed, my friend. You are my brother, and I'm a better human being for knowing you. Rest in peace, G. Respect. All right. While it's not clear what kind of cancer Adams battled with, some initial reports state that it was a brain cancer that took his life. Um, and it is nonetheless sad to hear, but something to acknowledge. So, um, if you're familiar with the brother, if you're not familiar with the brother, either way, um, you know, send some positive thoughts his way. But my point in doing this is not only to acknowledge him, but also to point out just, you know, how many of these, how many brothers are going down. We know in the last year we've talked about this repeatedly, you know, the numbers of men who are dying and the majority of them, I would argue, are less or below 60 years old. You know what I mean? Uh, others are dying real young. And that definitely speaks to our life expectancy, um, which last I checked was in the mid 60s. But it was still the lowest uh, when it came to white men, women, black women, et cetera. Um, black men tend to find themselves at the absolute bottom. And when you open it up to all ethnicities, um, they're around there with Native American men. So shout out to these brothers and um, I hope we can do a better job of supporting one another but it looks like he had a lot of love so uh, welcome to uh, membership show me good to see you in here All right yeah let's get into it let's get into it I'm not I'm not gonna be talking about Dave Chappelle all night in, in many ways I'm actually gonna take from his inspiration and delve into some things that I think have not been dealt with anywhere near enough. Nevertheless, I am inspired by Dave and others like him, truth, te truth tellers. Um, that is the tradition that I have tried to align myself with. Um, 
hopefully I can, you know, reach a level that some of these cats have been a part of. Nevertheless, <clears throat> shout out to him because he dropped the bomb this week with the closer or last week, I should say. And uh, in it was a lot more than people thought about. But in this initial piece, um, this is a piece done with Dan Wayans, Damon Wayans, excuse me. Um, and in it, Wayans describes what Dave did as uh, a gesture of freeing the slaves, right? And in it, he wasn't talking about black folk as a whole. He was talking about comedians. Comedians that have a long tradition of uh, saying things that make people uncomfortable in the hopes of getting people to see the world from a different vantage point. And uh, Dave is one of the best to do it, um, along with a number of others. And everybody has their favorites. Mine in particular, uh, you know, I got Patrice O'Neill in there, definitely Richard Pryor. I love a lot of brothers whose work, um, you know, tends to go. I won't say it's I won't say it's not regarded. I think for the most part, it just tends to be, um, I think, underestimated in value. Uh, shout out to Artisan for the cash app. Appreciate that, sir. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it tends to be brothers that, um, you know, it, they're even when appreciated, they're not necessarily uh, perceived on the level that I think they should. The comments that they make, the thoughts and reflections they have a lot of the time, they tend to be overestimated. I mean, underestimated, excuse me, in terms of impact. Um, and so when you talk about Dave, um, Damon Wayans is making this point because he's basically saying he basically, he, you know, championed comedy as a method. And by doing so, he kind of freed a lot of comedians who had confined themselves or been confined from outside pressure due to fear of being canceled. And Dave, you know, was in a position to do so, having walked away from a $50 million deal, uh, setting up a new one years later uh, with Netflix after traveling the country and performing, building up his name in and garnering a great deal of support, he was uniquely positioned. And I said this on uh, Green Gorilla show. He was uniquely positioned to not have to worry about being canceled and was able to speak truths that few others have. One of the questions I asked when I post this particular story, and you can find it anywhere. If you just put in Damon Wayans, Dave Chappelle, it'll come up. But <clears throat> one of the things I, I said was, I wonder if he also freed the professors, freed the academics researchers, the journalists? Is it just comedi comedians that he freed? It's an interesting question to ask when you think about it. What's up, Dr. Thunder? Good to see you in here. Appreciate that support. The Cash App Art of Ibmore. Thank you. Um, hope you're well. All right. What's up, Ed? Uh, Winston, of course. But anyway, um, Shonda, what's happening? Welcome. You know, did he free others other than just comedians? Did he give people room to speak a truth that's not necessarily politically correct? And one of the things I said is because he's a comedian, he's in a unique position to do it, but not just a comedian, a comedian that is outside of the establishment enough to not have to worry that his family won't eat if people are too offended by what he has to say. And uh, usually we regard people in that position as privileged and elite and so on and so forth and all the critiques that come with that. But there's another side to that. And that is the freedom to speak. Now, technically, we all have it, but you know how easy people can be removed. And we've known this, especially since 2016, uh, since uh, Me Too, we've seen people just be canceled, canceled for things they said decades ago, things they are accused of decades ago, no evidence required, simply on the word, usually of a woman. Not always, but usually. And that's taken as gospel. And if it can't be executed in a court of law, it's executed in the court of public opinion. And so Dave is in a unique position where, for the most part, attempts to cancel him have failed. He's prevail prevailed regardless. And so having been in that position for a while now and done several successful shows on Netflix that even when they were, um, you know, discarded by critics, the people love them. And that's, that's an important part of this, right? Because it definitely gave him a lot of credit to be able to speak with authority. Right. 200 people watching again, like, share, subscribe, join and donate support the channel. If you would. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Just uh, get this in here. 
Come on now. There we go. There we go. All right. Things are working now. Uh, let me get Dr. Thunder. Get that there. Okay. Hmm. Just trying to update a few things. All right. Anyway, so, um, having do so, I, I wouldn't say he set me free, but he definitely affirmed what I was already doing because, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, many of my academic brethren uh, are often not in a position to speak as full-throatedly as they would like. Uh, many of them will contact me and do so behind the scenes, but have been very concerned about family. Now, how did he do this? I mean, you know, outside of a, a wide variety of bits and analyses that were hilarious, some thought-provoking, uh, one of the main ones that he was able to kind of get across had to do with the LGBT community and uh, pointing out, right, that there is a way that the LGBT community, especially over media, has been able to invoke a certain type of privilege in and of themselves, a whiteness, if you will, where they can shift between whiteness and sexual uh, gender identity to articulate what they want and not have to suffer repercussion while at the same time canceling people that question uh, their ability to do so. Um, and contrary to the popular analyses that um, somebody like, well, really not even just Dave, heterosexual black men in media, when critiquing right, the LGBT community, they're often told that they're punching down. And Dave flipped the dynamic of that by showing that when, when they're able to access whiteness, right, that they're actually the ones punching down. And Dave made that a running theme of the show, which I tip my hat to him about because he actually illustrated how this canceling process happens. And it mainly happens through whiteness. Right? And so he challenged that dynamic and highlighted the fact that anybody can be critiqued. Nobody uh, should be in a position that is completely sacrosanct. And because of that, it needs to be talked about and, and examined. And he did so in a way that I think was fairly res respectful on a human platform, if you will, right? He highlighted the humanity of people while pointing out that nobody is in a position void of critique, nor should they be. And so I appreciate the way he went about that. And, in, and it's not that he's the first. He's part of a long tradition of those who've done that. But he has kept that tradition going and hopefully inspired a number of others, be they comedians or not, to continue in that line of truth telling, right? Regardless of whether or not the truths are comfortable or uncomfortable. But one of the things I wanted to deal with tonight, there's a couple things that I woke up this morning with, with on my mind. And in the spirit of truth telling, I wanted to delve into a little more deeply. And it had to do with the underdevelopment of black men. And there are four primary ways that I was thinking about this week that uh, don't get talked about. Right. And so I said, you know what, I think I want to get in to some of this to the best I can. Uh, let me see. Now, I shot BGS a link. So get, go ahead and come on in, man, if you could. Because um, uh, th th there's something he talked about that I think is definitely worth uh, starting this off with. He dropped a video this morning that I think, excuse me, this is thing over here is squeaky. Um, that is incredibly important. And I think dramatically misunderstood or underestimated. And as opposed to me explaining what he found, he was kind enough to come in and be willing to do so himself. What's up, man? Hey, Doc. What's going on? You, man. You dropped a bombshell this morning, um, and I'm not sure how many are aware. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you found? Oh. Go ahead and read the... Uh, uh... Shout out to Sandra Jean. Jean, thank you for that super sticker. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it, 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 to make a long story short, um, I was actually on the back chat with a couple of my longtime subs, and they put up a video um, uh, from the roommates, and um, he was actually uh, re, uh, actually talking about the recurring theme about uh, brothers that, that make uh, the average wage, which is about you know from forty to fifty thousand dollars. 
Shout out to MLR for that generous donation. And thank Appreciate you, Dardar, you, MLR. As well. Thank you, Dardar. Um, go ahead. Continue. And, uh, and, and the thing is, is that uh, we keep hearing this $50,000 mark, right? And mm -hmm. that's what he's complaining about because he said he, when he was in Texas, he was a teacher. He made, you know, he was, he was passionate. He was hardworking. But a lot of women wouldn't um, in his class wouldn't uh, date him because he only made fifty thousand dollars a year, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, uh, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I had been, you know, transferring a lot of my charts, and I found an old chart um, that had that you know, right around that sum. I think it was like fifty five thousand dollars, fifty seven thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And they called it the welfare cliff. So I started uh, looking at the chart and. And notice that uh, uh, what the fifty thousand dollar mark actually meant more than we actually thought. We thought it was just arbitrary. They were just making this stuff up. They're pulling it out of their ass because something that they heard. But in fact, um, a, a female in this society, black female in this society, uh, loses money if she dates or marries a man that makes less than fifty thousand dollars a year, sixty thousand dollars a year, to actually replace her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I actually. Um, actually pulled up the chart as you can see uh they call it the the welfare cliff and this is an old one this is not the current one this is the one from back from 2010 2012 when I actually wrote this mm -hmm. and uh and the, range, go ahead. so we yeah. saw ones in different states but in different but, states yeah but the but, but basically, still the same the narrative still the same and uh what the welfare cliff to how much money would you have to earn to actually um overcome the, the deficits of, of, of benefits that you would lose and uh and it right like like i said the the, the average was like fifty seven thousand dollars which is right around that that amount so it's actually higher than the amount that men make and uh i actually talked to doc about this and i said okay number one it doesn't come out of just nowhere and number two the state actually supports women that do this kind of stuff and the, the amount that they would lose uh, compared to, to just to get married and have a man in the house is quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And and this is where it comes from. But the thing is also it actually, you know, even though there's uh, the, the, the number of women on welfare is actually, you know, much smaller than the actual total. But the thing is it builds a culture. It gives a narrative and builds a culture and it puts a lot more uh, competition. It's not the competition. That's not just the market. It's actually the state. Mm -hmm. And, and so so that's why even women that are poor have this attitude that if you don't make over a certain amount of money, I can't be with you. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is just one factor in why this might be. So that's why I introduced it. You know, and in fact, I think that the total has actually gone up in this one. Uh, they say a woman that's making twelve dollars an hour. If she gets married, she's going to lose like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, um, her, her lifestyle is going to come down like, you know, like, like sixty nine, like sixty thousand dollars just right. by getting with a guy. That, uh, that that makes less and the and the median income of a black man you know even today is only like twenty six thousand dollars back then it was only twenty hmm. so how how can a guy make up for for uh, fifty thousand dollars worth of lost uh, benefits he can't mm -hmm. so there's a rec there's a you know even though uh, we think it's an emotional um, idea it's an emotional uh, uh, um, thing that women are doing yeah it is emotional and yet yeah, it has been passed down yet yeah, is it prejudicial of course but thing is there is some kind of logical basis behind this they're not just pulling this out of their minds right and and see the thing that got me was mm -hmm. i was thinking about this a couple of years ago i don't know if you guys remember remember they were putting around these um they were tweets and posts in social media where where especially women were saying uh, I'm tired of getting the what are you doing text, the WYD text. Yeah. And then they were holding up these lists, right? Mm -hmm. These lists of bills. And they were saying, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need to be able to pay these bills. Right. One of the interesting things I was seeing on them is when you looked at those lists and they were, I think they were being fairly honest. You yeah. start to see, you know, where they would have rent, they would have, you know, expense bills and uh, groceries and mm -hmm. utilities, but they would actually qualify for the benefits they get. So, right. Like, Rent wouldn't be fifteen hundred dollars. It would be like two hundred. You yes. know what I mean? And ain't nobody renting a two hundred dollar nothing. So you know, you know about the discounts. Uh, utilities were extremely low. And I was, I was looking at this, and I was saying, you know, what's interesting about it is a brother can make sixty thousand dollars, right, and still live what is perceived to be a lower quality of life than yes. a woman that we could perceive in this chart, because yes. 
because she's being compensated in ways like you know we talked about child child, well actually child care child support yeah yeah we have now this this is minus child support this is minus child support. this is not this not this not does not include child support which a woman that has a couple kids by a couple of different working guys she could get up to what eight seven or eight hundred dollars a month in child support so that's another you can tack on another eight to ten thousand dollars a year exactly but but she you know she'll have child care covered you know mm-hmm. um you know uh what is it energy housing food cash all of these kind of things medical just, yeah medical. medical and that's and that's if she's working because some don't mm-hmm. um but some are able to work and as you said they're incentivized to stay within a particular income range right passing up certain opportunities which may and may in and of itself explain some other things like you know we we you know on youtube we joke about um you know the kind of behavior of black women in service positions right uh, sometimes the rudeness or whatever this yeah. may, this may actually provide a rationale <laughs> <laughs> and also and also why uh uh why so many white black women actually make much less than black men mm-hmm. they, they, yeah. they're not incentivized to make more they're not incentivized to make more so when you when you look at this what we're talking about is a middle class lifestyle without the labor demands to to be middle class. So a brother who's making sixty thousand may not live in as nice a place, right. may not drive as nice a car. Every bill he has, he has to pay it for in its entirety. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I did a show last year talking about how, uh, when it comes to welfare or public aid, even though the man in the house rule is no longer uh, technically law, much of the treatment uh, that men get, black men in particular, is still consistent with that era. Mm-hmm where there's limited access to resources, even for those who are in severe need. Um, But we see that definitely shifted in a different way when it comes to women. So what we're looking at is two people who, um, you know, may technically have the same kinds of earnings, although uh, that earning structure is very different for them, um, but living two different lifestyles. And it it also kind of explains the kind of cavalier you know, dismissal that, you know, some women have, have grown, you know, very comfortable in, in doing when it comes to men who approach them mm-hmm. uh, that may even live, may even earn more than they do, more than they do, yes. you know, but it still doesn't necessarily shift, um, you know, or impress her. And we're starting to see some reasons for that, right? And what, what else came to you when, you, when, you know, when you started looking over these kind of charts, um, what else came to mind for you? Um, you know, one thing that, that, that just came to mind, you know, how uh, men think that children to a man, a uh, children is not an, is, is a liability. Okay. We love them. We want to take care of them and all that kind of stuff, but they're actually a liability to, to most men, right? Because they cost, right? Mm-hmm. They don't bring in any money. They don't bring any other, uh, uh, other resources with them. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's flipped when it's a woman. Mm. You can see just by her having one child, the kind of resources that she can actually pay her yeah. for having one child. Yeah. So the so way women look at women, especially black women, look at children versus the way black men look at children is completely different. So a lot of this, you know, it's almost like looking in a in a in a in a, in a dark mirror. OK, yeah. you're seeing the opposite reflection. So everything is backwards in a, the way we actually approach things. And this kind of explains it. It's actually state sponsored. And like you said, uh, what they created is a black female buffer class. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to be delving a little bit more into that tonight. Uh, but it is definitely that it is a buffer class. And in that, there's also a shift, right? There's there's a kind of cultural outlook, one could say, where you mm-hmm. don't even necessarily have to be on welfare to have the attitude if you know that this is accessible. Right? Mm-hmm. This, that this is accessible. And, and I think in many ways especially over the last 50 to 60 years, it has shifted, right? The outlook, the worldview of many black women in ways that di- 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 <laughs> Shout out to Uru. Hope you're well, good brother. Um, thank you for the support. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying it shifts the outlook in ways that uh, diverge from black men's outlook because we live two different qualities of life. And I've been mm-hmm. saying this for the last few years, you know, when you really start to see the impact of just welfare what was going on especially like if you take the 70s right we know black men are pulling away from marriage and have been doing so since 65 roughly speaking but by the time you get to the 70s you got the the war on drugs 
right? And so mm-hmm. whereas women are on welfare on the lower levels, going to college, uh, trying to transition into white collar jobs, mm-hmm. you have the rise in the, in the prison industrial complex. Mm-hmm. Black men are going to prison when they're going to school. Mm-hmm. Right? This is a, so fast forward 50, 60 years and what do you have? You know, completely different worldview um, right. on the basis of gender in the community. Yeah, the the, the other thing that that uh, when I was actually going through this and actually going through the chart, it's something else dawned on me. Right, remember, uh, remember the I, I think it was uh, it was actually a video back in the in the eighties that was done. I can't remember who actually did it, but the thing is, uh, where a woman said a father for a child is not uh, not important, not essential, right? Mm-hmm. And you hear that refrain, and, and there was a book called "Promises That I Can Keep." Why you know why women actually choose motherhood before marriage, right? Mm-hmm. And in all these situations, right, they say a husband is a liability, mm-hmm. and it and really, you know, it didn't make sense till I looked at this chart, and then I said, they're not kidding. Yeah, they weren't kidding. Okay, for yeah. them to get married, especially to the average guy, to the the median guy that makes, you know, in uh. uh Thirty thousand dollars or less, according to this chart, he is a liability. Yeah, and 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 this is an interesting thing in and of itself because uh, we see it at the at the entertainment level. You guys mm-hmm. remember when uh, Monique was talking about a conversation she had with Whoopi Goldberg, Monique the comedian, right? A conversation with Whoopi Goldberg, and Whoopi told her one of the things holding your career back is just the presence of your husband. Mm. That was profound, right? She said, just the presence of that black man right there. She mm-hmm. said, what you need to do is cut ties mm. and watch your career ascend. Mm-hmm. Appreciate that support, Henry. Um, I'm paraphrasing, you know, but that's basically what was said. And you guys can find the interview yourselves. So, you know, if you question that, you can look it up. But she was very clear. She said, this is what Whoopi told her was holding her career back, mm. married to a black man. Mm. You know, so it, it, in and of itself, I think that's incredibly important. Um, it also has, I think, an impact on relationships. And this is a piece that uh, many of you have seen this last few days. Um, I posted this on my page, and I think uh, Kevin Samuels and O'Shea even you know, posted it on their pages. So I think a lot of people have seen it. It comes mm-hmm. from time.com. And uh, the quote I used is from the article itself. It says, a Pew, uh, the Pew study, which uses information from the 2019 American Community Survey, notes that men are now more likely to be single than women which was not the case 30 years ago. Right. Black people are much more likely to be single at 59%. Appreciate that support, Doc. Dr. Thunder in the house. Um, but he said, uh, um, so black people are much more likely to be single at 59% than any other race. And black women, 62%, are the mm-hmm. most likely to be single of any sector. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Especially in relation to what you found. You know, uh, uh, this makes sense. The welfare culture makes sense. But also, you got to think this is also generational. Because yes. uh, the re- the reason that uh, as, uh, say, like the side of generation and, and boomers start to die out, uh, the, the, the women that actually grew up in this culture, guess what? They don't believe in marriage. <laughs> so as, as the generations kind of die off, you can see the marriage rate go down, especially amongst black people. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and it's interesting you say generational because this semester I'm teaching my writing course mm-hmm. and the, the course is entitled Writing About American Inequality. So right. we cover a variety of different inequalities. And right now we're looking at gender and sex. And, uh, I'm you know, we're watching the film Claudine. Mm. Uh, oh, Diane very, very, very poignant when you look at something like this. Yeah. Diane Carroll, James Earl Jones. Um, classic black exploitation film, but mm-hmm. one of the first to delve into um, you know the welfare state and how people navigate it. So if you're not familiar, right, Diane Carroll plays Claudine, who's uh, on welfare with I think she had five kids. Yeah, um, and she's also working illegally as a domestic to make money mm-hmm. on the table. Mm-hmm. And so you see the kind of tensions around uh, marriage when she meets James Earl Jones' character Roop. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't meet no brother's name Rupert anymore. It's interesting. <laughs> I keep seeing thank, Rupert thank, in a long thank time. God, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but Rup is a trash man. He's a single. Well, he's he's a he's not a single father. He's a trash man. He's single, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but he does have kids in other states that he pays uh, uh, child support on. Mm -hmm. But later in the film, you see that, uh, you know, some of his exes have filed for child support. Wow. So even wow. though he's already sending checks, mm -hmm. right, they, they decided to go through the court right, to get more out of him. Mm -hmm. Right. So he contemplates going underground. He contemplates quitting his job and becoming a pimp. That, you know, he's kind of having these conversations with with uh, uh, Claudine. But at the same time, you know, she's trying to she wants to marry Roop. And yet she knows that welfare will be withdrawn um, if she does mm -hmm. so. And, and so there's a lot of tensions on the black relationship because mm -hmm. of that state involvement. And, and so what you're pointing to here highlights another dimension of it. That's kind of become uh, that's taken center stage since the 70s, I would say, uh, in, a, in a unique way that they definitely weren't talking about uh, with Claudine. Right. But it right. less points to the impact of middle class income without the requisite labor uh, that primarily benefits women and uh, men find themselves on the outside of. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is <laughs> is. Um... But to paraphrase uh, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, black men are the permanent underclass, and they mm -hmm. treat us like that. Yeah. We, they don't. There is no uh, boots nor uh, bootstraps to pull yourself up on. Okay, it's, <laughs> uh, black men have to get it from the mud. You know what? Now, at my core, I am fairly silly, believe it or not. And I, you know, I t I'm told I have, I have resting. Uh, what one of my students said? I got a resting bitch face. Okay, you yeah. about to get a resting yeah. F. <laughs> but but I do. I have a serious face, and it's not intentional. But I got to shout out Clutch and Stick. Look at what, look what he wrote. Oh yeah, <laughs> Rupert Xavier Sasparilla. Sasparilla. Cool house rock. You, you forgot the end, Sasparilla. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Clutch! I ain't got nothing to say to you. <laughs> but yo, I was I was. So here's the thing. So tonight, I wanted to point out four different areas where black men find themselves. Um, treated very differently from mm -hmm. women, right? And so the first area was a middle-class income without the requisite labor. And I think that's what this really highlights, you know, in terms of what you brought to the table with this chart. And I really hope brothers in this space will, it, see, here's the thing. We have got to take these concepts that we talk about every week and, and apply them. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, when we get to another part of what I'm talking about, we have a tendency to revert back to pre 2000 kind of attitudes about black men. We as black men ourselves mm -hmm. about, you know, especially when we're talking about other black men or black men in the news, we have got to take these concepts that we're learning and developing and apply them, uh, engage in them, use them in discussions, use them in the class if need be. But I'm saying we need to, we need to use them because I'm telling you, these conversations are not happening on the up and up on, you know, on, uh, in, in, in uh, public view and other right. spaces. They're not happening. No, so the not. concepts coming out of this space are incredibly important. This is why I started with Dave Chappelle. It's no accident that he's a comedian and he's able to say what he's saying because he's outside the established channel. I mean, and some people have decried that. Some people have said, well, you know, we shouldn't listen to this because it's coming from a comedian. No, it, it could only come from a comedian because everybody else is scared as hell of losing their fucking jobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Thunder just did a video with with ike, uh, ike and uh they said the same same thing you got to get the bag first you know and that applies even to academics you know yes uh, and you said it uh before you venture out you know on that ledge you got to have the bag which for an academic is tenure yeah yeah it definitely is and 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 it's and that's what i tell uh especially if i have uh you know um grad students that want my help and they want to do this work i'm like you got to get tenure first but mm -hmm. the, the reason for that is because, you know, many of us are dependent on structures that will turn and punish us, us for speaking freely. Mm -hmm. And that's why it took somebody that was outside of those structures. Right. right? Shout out to Blade Runner. Appreciate that support. Um, but that's what I'm saying. So so we got to. So if, if we have people who are in position to advance the conversation, we have to be courageous enough to take it up, engage the concepts and where we can apply them. Right. And this is one of them. So uh, so the first of four points was dealing with middle class income without requisite labor. That is right. the difference between black men and women. Black yes. men do not get middle class income for doing nothing. We don't. We don't get it for, because we exist. We don't get it. We don't get it because we're poor. We don't get it because we're homeless. We don't get it because we have children. Black men do not get these types of support arbitrarily. We really don't. 
you know, the most you'll find is black men who get this because they're doing something illegal, which is very different. Mm -hmm. right? And then you got to hope they don't get caught because we will go to jail for illegal. Well, even that, even that. that, even that doing uh, something illegal is work because you're taking an enormous risk every time you go out. Risk of being killed, risk of being mm -hmm. uh, hurt, risk of going to prison. So basically, you're actually taking more risk than the most middle class people. So you are putting in the same kind of work. It's just different. Well, and here's the thing about that, too. It's even a risk when it's legal in many yeah, countries. Yeah, that's true. We talk about, uh, like, long-distance truck driving. Mm -hmm. It's legal, but there's a reason everybody doesn't do it. You know, anybody that's ever, you know, you, ever, you know those long blinks when you've been driving too long? Yeah, yep. And you're talking about it's only the grace of God by which I have opened my eyes before I didn't hit something? Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, those are life-threatening kind of tasks. I don't care if you're talking about firefighters, soldiers police officers um you know these are life-threatening situations that you find yourself in longshoremen you name it and mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons that blue collar men will tend to get paid more is because they do riskier jobs and they work longer hours but those that risk in and of itself still finds itself there even when it's legal and that i find interesting but the second of four points that i wanted to delve into about the differences between black male life Mm -hmm. and black female life is uh what i call wealth building without capital right wealth building without capital right um hold on let me see if i can how to do this with uh guest on the screen let me try and share this if i can i think i gotta okay yeah that'll work all right so here we go appreciate that support mr meach thank you all right here we go so this is a video you can find here on youtube uh sorry it's cut off but this was the the best i could get of the thumbnail but it reads how to buy a house with your section 8 voucher right uh anywhere in the united states or puerto rico puerto rico now this is a real video this is not you know a scam this is not uh you know just a uh what do you call it uh a, a clickbait um, you can actually watch this video and she explains uh, as one black woman, presumably talking to other black women. It's very explicit about who she's talking to. And what she's basically saying is how you can use your Section 8 status or voucher to basically secure uh, a home. Wow. And and this is something that I hadn't seen prior to this, right? Um, okay, hold on. Somebody said... I didn't think anything that was possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hold on, Dr. Thunder is having some trouble. Let me add it again. All right. Um, all right, uh, Javon, I, 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 I try to do it again. So uh, Dr. Thunder, let me know if you're having any trouble. Anyway, um, let me do, I'm sorry. Let me just catch up on a couple of these because uh, I realize I haven't actually given out any wrenches in a very long time. Um, all right. See. Okay. I think that yeah, right. Javon, yeah, Javon has his. Okay. And Dr. Thunder has his. Okay. All right. So we should be good. I need to build up the crew. You know. Anyway, um, so in talking about this, what what we're really looking at is not just buying a house to be someplace more comfortable. That you know it, when we talk about home ownership, you know, it, it's become somewhat of a status thing in some regards. Some people regard it as just something to do and so they can say they have not. No, this is wealth building. This is one of the main practices that created the middle class, the capacity to own property that accrues in value uh, simply if it's kept up. You know, you don't necessarily have to do anything extensive. Um, you know. Appreciate that support, Uru. He's in here tonight. All right. He's too stupid. Anyway, all right. So um, when I talk about wealth building without capital, right? Just like I said earlier, if black men are not able to access state resources and welfare to the degree that others have, and we know this is the case, especially even since last year, since we found so many black men homeless this last few years, and that was even pre-COVID, 
we knew that uh, that black America constituted half of America's homeless, and yet black men constituted an unmeasured because they don't always disaggregate the data by gender uh, when they do do the racial breakdown. But we know black men tend to be homeless to a far greater degree, uh, especially if they've been incarcerated and they're trying to find uh, lodging or so on and so forth. And so many of the tent cities you can find around the country, especially in places like LA, were filled with black men, right? So we know that uh, the resources are not as readily available, but if those emergency needed resources can also now be used to acquire, purchase and acquire homes that accrue in value and, cre and, and create wealth, then that changes the game dramatically. And it serves to further uh, separate black men and women, right? Because, uh, you know, with home ownership, you can pass that down to your children, right? That's one of the key components of wealth. It is transferable, right? It can be transferred upon one's death. You can sell it. You can do all kinds of things with it. You know, so this wealth does not just, uh, you know, uh, put food on the table like food stamps for an individual family. It actually accrues in value and can be passed down. But if black men are barred from it, that creates a whole nother aspect to this um see here okay shout out to roger report good to see you in here man hope all is well okay yeah so that's one of the things there any thoughts about this bg what do you think i mean this <laughs> yeah, it's kind of reminds it kind of reminds me of the uh you know uh the, the 40s and 50s in the gi bill where white men <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rashid, for the for the uh, yeah, super chat. That. Thank you. Uh, kind of reminds me of the uh, the service uh, black servicemen where they were supposed to get the GI Bill. They're supposed to get uh, lo uh, loans for houses and stuff like that, but they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And it and, and it sounds uh, the same way to me with this. Um, now I don't know how you can actually buy houses um, on Section Eight when you're not supposed to have any kind of income. Mm -hmm. or any kind of property okay it's supposed to be a means test now how they find a loophole to actually do this i mean the, evidently the, the federal government actually knows about it mm -hmm. if you can find the loophole but they do nothing yeah. but black men can't black men can't get this at all what if, what if you were black and on section eight trying to do the same thing as a male yeah exactly if you can get on section eight if right? you can get a section eight the, yeah the, the the odds of black men getting on section eight even for um uh, even for a project is um uh, project section eight which they call an, uh, another hud bill um is is very limited you know they they'd rather put you in the street but this is where we have um okay um uh, appreciate that big mike uh let's see here uh okay big mike says uh we need more of these deep dives and uh and complex analyses of our community and the society at large uh, I'd be curious to know what you guys see as solutions to the myriad of issues that plague our unique demographic. Thanks again. Don't worry. I got you tonight. I do have some solutions for you. So let me just kind of pull through this. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we can add to what you found in terms of, you know, the welfare cliff, right? We didn't talk about, you know, the welfare cliff doesn't include child support, doesn't include alimony, but mm -hmm. it also doesn't anticipate um, being able to purchase homes. Right through Section Eight, so these are all uh, kind of you know advances that work on one in one context and not in another. And mm -hmm. here's another one as far as wealth building without capital. You guys know I've been talking about this since the onset of the pandemic, where everything from PPP loans to um, you know specific philanthropic projects to give uh, Black women access to society, give them special training, were not targeted to men at all. Whether it's small business entrepreneurial support or whether it had to do with um, increasing job skills. I have not yet seen one that targets black males who are unemployed to a greater degree than black women, who definitely could use access to education. Uh, none of them, no, none of them were targeted and they have been, you know, for the most part, over the overwhelmingly targeted to black women. So that being said, and shout out to Raekwon the Chef, new member, good to have you in here, man. Um, Yet another one, because we talked about um, there's MasterCard, there's Visa, there's uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, there's Google. There's, there's a number of programs that have primarily only targeted black women. And um, here's yet another. Right, This one you can find in the is in binnews.com. 
and it reads, six black women have been named the first grant recipients from a multi-million dollar fund created specifically for black owned businesses. The $10 million fund is a partnership initiative between PepsiCo and National Urban League to address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black business owners. As the pandemic exposed existing disparities many minority business owners face, we saw a fundamental threat that could erase the decades of progress black owned restaurants have made. Now, hold on, let me put this up a little bit. This is actually the image they use wow. in the article itself, right? Uh, so they're talking about restaurants, right? The investment will help black restaurateurs not only recover from the pandemic, but set them on a path to long-term economic resilience. Uh, this is coming from C.D. Glenn, Vice President, Global Head of Philanthropy at, at the PepsiCo Foundation, said in a news release earlier this year. We are inspired by the progress we are making through our collaboration with the National Urban League to address a fundamental gap and create opportunities for Black business owners to build generational wealth and continue to strengthen their communities. Were there any men? No. Oh, okay. Specifically targeted, um, you know, well, from my read of the article, no. I'll just leave it at that. No. But this is what I'm talking about. So when you add this type of wealth building without capital, meaning that this rests on whether we're talking about uh, federal uh, resources or whether we're talking about philanthropic private resources, Mm -hmm. have wealth building without capital. We have access uh, primarily for black women that black men don't find themselves getting. And we've been seeing these uh, more so in the last year. Now, they've been this has been happening for years. Mm -hmm. It's been most pronounced during the pandemic. Because they're all of this emphasis on small businesses, keeping small businesses open, right? Well, for the most part, black black community don't have nothing but small businesses, if you will, or employees, right? So to have this primarily finance only black women, you know, across the board, this is this is incredibly um, this is completely offsetting in terms of of where black men and women find themselves. So whether you know, so so first we talked about you know middle class income without labor. Now we're looking at wealth building without capital. We looked at in terms of both Section 8 and in terms of philanthropic opportunities that primarily go to women over men. Right? So those are two ways so far uh, that we can look at underdevelopment. Right? Any any thoughts about uh, you know these kind of awards being given to women over men? Uh, <laughs> you know the thing is is it's it's um, it's becoming trite. Mm-hmm. Because uh, if you think about Google, uh, it was Goldman Sachs, um, uh, Black Girl Rock, Black Girl Code Camp, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Black Women Businesses, and and th- this one is even isn't even targeted at women. But guess who gets all get all the uh, all the grants? Right. That's why I asked: Is there is, is there at least one guy that's that's in this bunch? And you said no, which I'm not surprised. Okay, it's oh. like. Uh, it's almost like BLM, okay, Black Lives Matter, using the, the, the images of black men being killed. And guess who get to all the benefits? It's not black men. No, it's not. It's not. And this is one of the reasons that we're going to have to start moving differently. Uh, and that's what I want to, you know, kind of talk to brothers about tonight. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, and, of course, you know, you got to always listen to Uru because he, <laughs> he got that hammer, boy. He hitting that point hard. Like, look. You gotta become more litigious, get in court. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Sue, sue your own women. Uh, it's like a child suing their own parents. You know. <laughs> uh, shout out to Otis. Appreciate that support, man. Right. So, the, so that was you know we're dealing with point two of four wealth building without capital. Now we're going to transition to point three. This is a little uh, more general, but you guys are more familiar since we've been talking about this for a minute now. Right. And that has to do with um, the incentivized internalization of feminism, right? The internalization of feminism. There is a reward for internalizing feminism. And I would argue that award does apply to men at a certain, to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why you find so many white collar black male feminists in the academy and so on and so forth. Because again, if it doesn't have a direct monetary benefit, at the very least, it may prevent you from difficulty at the job. It may prevent you from getting fired when you raise question uh, questions about things that uh, are not supposed to be questioned in general, right? Uh, but mm-hmm. there's a couple 
points here. Uh, so when I talk about the incentivized internalization of femi feminism, one of the points I'm referring to is that um, it, it, there is a general promotion of female superiority. Uh, and that is in many ways tied to anti-Black misandry. Now, if you're talking about people that have access to resources that they don't necessarily, that their men don't have access to, if they're mm -hmm. able to purchase wealth building properties, if they're able to have different jobs and actually don't need to get paid more, there's no incentive for them to climb the ladder, as it were, because they actually make more by not doing so. It's kind of understandable that a sense of female superiority, a sense of entitlement, if you will, uh, might come about from that. And that that we actually see in the um, the clip you pulled from the roommates at the start mm -hmm. of your video. Um, that was an interesting kind of pull. Right. What made you decide to use that and tell people what you were? Be because we've heard this before, you know, mm -hmm. we've heard this before in, in all classes of women. OK, if um, they, you know, this is black female hypergamy. If he can't make my life better, why do I need to be with him? Right. Nothing has to do with love. Nothing. It has nothing to do with feeling or sex or he's attractive. If he can't make my life better, mm -hmm. why do I need to be with him? Right. So if if uh, say just using the chart, if he can't exceed, mm -hmm. you know, if he can't exceed what the state can do for me, I you know, he's he's actually a detriment to my life. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff they talk aspirationally talk about there are women and and yeah. men uh, abandon them and men won't date them and men don't want to get married. Um, like like the young folks say, that's cap, you know, mm -hmm. 10 gallon cap. Right. Mm -hmm. It's large cap. The line. Because there's there's actually a very logical, very uh, uh, economic, uh, fiduciary reason why they don't want to get married. They just lie about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very logical. It's very mm -hmm. strategic. Um, and that's something I want to highlight as well. When we talk about, you know, issues with black women, I want brothers to, to get out of this zone that, you know, they're just operating, you know, out of some kind of mis mystery hatred. No, this has been cultivated. Mm -hmm. This has been cultivated over generations. And this is why I'm talking about the internalization of feminism. What I'm saying is you're talking about an incentive based program right. that comes with benefits over yes. generations. Grandmothers are teaching mothers. Mothers are teaching daughters. Uh, daughters are teaching granddaughters. This is being passed down. And while this superiority is being promoted in media as well mm -hmm. as in terms of access. Oh, I you, you mean, you, 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 go no further than the profession that you're in, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a male feminist and you speak the feminist line, you get book deals, TV appearances, uh, 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 paid conferences, trips, all the kinds of give you all these perks mm -hmm. if, you, if you follow the feminist line. So even males... The, what they call male feminists actually get rewarded for doing this kind of work. Well, and if you bring up black men in any way other than pejorative in a class mm -hmm. setting, you might find yourself like my brother Hood Scholar in trouble, brought into uh, your dean's office or your chair's office like like an errant child who got into a fight in the in, in the in the schoolyard. <laughs> <A> food fight. <laughs> brought in to be punished, right? Because you're talking about black men in a way beyond dismissal. Right. But these kind of attitudes, again, they're reinforced in media. And you guys know we talk about this in media all the time. We talk about the kind of uh, female superiority that we've seen. These are popular tropes that have mm -hmm. been consistent. It's reinforced by material access, class, uh, middle class access. Um, you know, it, it, and here's the thing. You don't have to. You know, most women in particular, they don't have to become feminists they, in, a, in, a, in a literal sense. Many of them have never even read a feminist scholar. Many of them can't tell you who the relevant feminist scholars are. They don't have to. They don't have to be radicalized in that way. They just have to be willing to take advantage of those benefits that offset Black families. Um, but here's the key. Here's one of the things that I think we don't talk about enough in terms of this, uh, this incentivized uh, feminism. And that is the, it, that it promotes a fundamental confidence in the capacity mm. to advance. Now, what do yes. I mean? The, the fundamental confidence in the now this goes to your concept of the 92, right? Mm -hmm. 92, who's very business driven, you know, white collar professional looking to become a mogul. And when she meets a man, she's looking for her Jay Z as she is her, she is her own Beyonce, as it were, you know, very mogul, very uh, status conscious, right? Kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. 
you know, much of the time you'll find these women with a greater confidence and the ability to advance in society. And once you look at the data, the stuff we've been talking about tonight, you can see how that's been cultivated. How does a man respond when he's been told no since childhood? Mm, right. He's been followed by police officers before he even knew what they were there for. When he's mm -hmm. been questioned by teachers who saw him as a threat um, long before he ever understood what a threat meant, right? Mm. And who's turned down, who's, who's put into special ed classes, you know, on, at, a, at a disproportionate rate, despite his intelligence, not because of lack thereof, right? Who finds himself not able to access the same streams that, that allow one to transition into college and white collar life. He's actually relegated to another if he's not able to be skillful with the ball or skillful with the legal activity or anything of that nature, or he's not particularly right. retaining, right? If you find that you have men, boys and men who've been consistently rejected, consistently on the outside, right? Being told no. This is why when I talked about uh, Melvin Van Peebles the other week, there was a particular hero of mine, mine, shout out to Mr. Van Peebles and his family. One of the things they talked about in the film, Badass, that his son made of his life at a particular point, uh, one of the things they pointed out was when you've been to told no a lot, you your brain functions in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. I think when you're talking about black men, we know about being told no. We know what a no looks like when the word isn't even used. <laughs> we know what it looks like when you go to rent an apartment and the woman didn't expect that you were black. And yes. you, and you yeah. know what a no looks like. You mm -hmm. know what it's like to go on a job interview and as soon as you walk in the door, Mm -hmm. haven't seen. They haven't looked at any mm -hmm. of your, your, your accomplishments, nothing. You know when you get a look. And even Richard Pryor used to talk about this back in the 70s, right? But when you know when, you, when you've been told no without even having to hear the words, how does that affect one's innate confidence? Now, I'm not saying that Black men can't achieve. There are plenty of brothers that do, but they achieve in spite of. Right. There's no comfort in knowing that things are going to happen simply because exist yeah they're, they're the anomalies outside of the outside of the matrix outside of the machine mm -hmm. absolutely so the so the confidence in the capacity to advance meaning that you've seen it happen you've seen it happen with uh, with parents with relatives with girlfriends so on and so forth black men it's a different battle so when i talk about the incentivize the incentivized internalization of feminism i'm talking about all of the requisite privileges and advancements that come with a system that's set up and designed for you to be able to at least have what I call a glass floor, right? It's a glass mm -hmm. floor because it can break at any time. If, if mm -hmm. government decides to withdraw for any reason, and this was a big fear that many women had in the last couple of years, you right. can go through it. Uh, but in the in, in as much as black women are standing on a glass floor, black men in many ways have a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that seems to be one of the main dynamics between us. But we'll move on to number four. And this is a big one. Right. This is the this is the four. So we've had three so far. We talked about middle class income without labor. We talked about wealth building without capital. We've talked about a incentivized internalization of feminism. Right. But the fourth one is no hypercarceral treatment. No break that down. Carceral treatment. Carceral in the same sense that you think of incarceration. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you have a group that is not treated the same, right? We're mm -hmm. just talking about black men and women. And by and large, look, and let me be clear. I'm not exactly saying that women are cognizant of all of that. Many, many are to different degrees, but when you start to look at how all of these systems overlap, after a while, you'll meet many women that just take it as a given. Mm -hmm. And this is how, you know, various types of privilege work. If you have it, you don't really think about how you got it. You don't think about why you have it. What you what you tend to do is look at people that don't have it and look down on them. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, when I talk about no hyper hyper uh, hypercarceral treatment, what I'm saying is even when women and this is really a cross race are mm -hmm. arrested or brought to court or whatnot for committing mm -hmm. the same crimes as men, they get 65 percent less sentence time, less less punishment for what they've done when it's the same crime as men. So when you have a system where you're able to, to, to have access to employment, to middle and middle class income without labor, when you can actually uh, have access to awards and uh, grants and fellowships or be able to buy property with Section 8, uh, you know, uh, uh, vouchers mm -hmm. to embrace a philosophy of female superiority and advance on that. 
uh, and you're not going to jail despite committing the same crimes. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of quick examples. Y'all know me. It's probably going to be more like seven or eight. <laughs> I'm going to go through some you, quick examples. You, you, like they say, you got a million of them. Well, we, we, you know, we got we got to keep on top of these because we I think when you live this, when you live it, you kind of take it like, you know, this is oh, that's just that story. But when you start to add it up, it paints a different picture. So I'm going to show you a couple things. OK, let's go through a few of these um, and I'm not going to go through them in, in depth. I'm going to show you where you can get more information. If you remind me, I'll try and remember to put the links in the description after the show is over. Uh, but this is an article coming out of newsbreak.com two days ago, and it's entitled police. Uh, and, excuse me. It's entitled mother stabbed her one year old baby in front of a cop. Mm. Wow. Greenville, North Carolina police said a young mother stabbed her one year old child in front of an officer in Greenville on Monday. The toddler was transported to the hospital after being stabbed by the 21 year old woman. Um, Sierra Dyer was charged with attempted murder, murder and felony child abuse. Now, here's here's the thing. I'm not saying that individual women are not being penalized for their crimes. You know, surely they are. This is an article about a woman that was arrested for doing that. But you don't see policy being directed at black mothers in a large kind of way. This is the kind of thing that tends to happen with black men. The treatment is if one black man does something, all black men are under threat. How many of you guys have seen posts in the last couple of weeks where it went from talking about R. Kelly to talking about black men raping women across the board? Y'all tell me. Wow. Yeah. Put a one in the comment section if you've seen the conversation switch from R. Kelly to black men in general. You guys tell me what you see. Have you seen that in social media? Mm hmm. Right. So when one black male does something, all black males are under question. This is something that Dr. Tommy Curry even talks about when we were talking about uh, uh, intimate partner homicide, right? Men who killed their spouses somehow, even though you have an extremely small percentage. I mean, you know, as a friend of mine used to say, you, you more likely get struck by lightning than be killed by your significant other. But whereas you might have you have a few hundred men who kill their their female uh, partners and you have a slightly less, believe it or not, uh, women who kill their men, their male partners out of 43 million. You're talking about a couple hundred a year. But still, when it happens, when a black man has done so, all black men are called into question. When a black woman kills her spouse, we don't assume that all black women are a threat and neither does mainstream society. So this mother stabs her one-year-old child. We don't call black motherhood into question across the board, right? But they have no, see, and the ones are still coming in. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> but you barely, I don't even think you guys have seen this case, right? And they damn sure, even if you did see it, again, it's not treated as a mass issue. It's treated as an individual issue. Let me ask you this question, Doc, because mm -hmm. we know how trigger-happy cops are. Mm -hmm. Can a black man pull a knife in front of a cop, much less stab somebody with with a knife and survive? Well, we'll be clear. Stab a child, a one year old child with yeah. a knife in front of a cop, yeah. in front of a cop. You even pull the knife out. Yes. No. And I'm and here. And, and here's the thing. I'm not saying that there needs to be a mass prison building where black women who have committed crimes need to be. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's a difference in treatment. When an individual black person does, black male does something, it reflects on all black men, right? When a, a black woman of this sort does something, we don't have that same dy dynamic. And this was something I used to used to only see the difference between when it came to white people and black people, you know, but now I've been seeing it in terms of gender in a whole different way. And it's really starting to get to me. So let's go to the next one. Now this one, you know, I'm just, I'm talking about women. So it'll switch uh, to different racial groups at times. Let me uh, pull this one up. So this is a story you can find on foxnews.com. It's entitled California mom through teens secret drinking parties watch sex abuse, says authorities. Shannon uh, M. O'Connor, 47 years old, demanded teens keep drunken parties secret from parents and her husband. Right. This is a California mother. She threw these secret parties for teens uh, for her teen son and his friends where she supplied alcohol and condoms and watch sexual encounters, including sexual assaults between drunken teens. 
Um, now, mind you, there have been other stories that I've reported on in the last year where the mothers actually threw these parties and actively participated themselves, even including sex, right? But at this particular article, she's accused of organizing the parties, right? Now, you tell me, how many Black men do you know can organize sex parties with their daughters and their daughter's friends and not reflect poorly on all Black men? Huh? <laughs> How many of those think pieces would be directed at at black male toxicity? Right. Even if a black woman did it, right? If she was married, they blame the father. Absolutely. And you guys have seen that in articles we've covered here, where people will will create a father that's not even in the scenario and make him the cause of mm. whatever she did. Like when we talked about the case a few weeks ago of the woman in Chicago who who shot her son because she couldn't find her SD card. Yeah, people fabricated the father in the scenario and blamed him. We don't even know if the man was alive, or the or the, or the child that wandered out, uh, yeah. the two year old that wandered out and drowned in the pool. Right. Okay, because yeah. the mother was occupied or sleep. Okay, the father wasn't. Father was even mentioned, but they blamed him. But they blamed him. So here we have a woman throwing these parties, and we know full well. Now she's been arrested. I'm not saying that they won't get arrested. Generally, they serve far less time for the crime as men. But it's not that she's she's not being arrested. My issue is that when it comes to men, particularly black men, uh, you don't see this kind of scenario. You see it applied to all black men, for one, or all men. Uh, and the overall treatment, even in the court of public opinion, is very different. But let's go on to another. Okay. Uh, this is one you can find on MSN.com. Woman shoots boyfriend after call from unknown number. Right. Uh, a fight between a boyfriend and girlfriend over a call from an unknown number escalated to a man being shot on Friday, according to Memphis Police, the Memphis Police Department. Police said it happened at the Meadow Lake Apartments. Uh, MPD said Alexis Kemp got into an argument with her boyfriend about someone calling her um, uh, from an unknown number. Kemp got her gun and told Denzel Bell to leave, according to police. Uh, then they reported that Kemp shot Bell as he ran out of the apartment. On arrival, police said they found Bell in the parking lot suffering from a gunshot wound to the back of his upper arm. She was arrested and charged with aggravated assault. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, how many how many stories can you do on this? Uh, uh, women running the, the boyfriends over, shooting them, beating them up, um, hitting them with bumpers after they've been assaulted. I mean... Um, and they, you know, that's not even the, you know, uh, the uh, counting the countless um, numbers of times where you see women destroying the the, the boyfriend's car mm -hmm. because they're mad, and mm -hmm. and they knowing that they're going to get away with. It. Nobody's going to do anything. People just stand by and watch them destroy the car. Or, or like I've shown on video on my show, uh, running men over, mm -hmm. trying to use the car to kill them. Um, absolutely. So here, you know, you got a case where she shoots her boyfriend over. Yeah. An unknown caller, unknown phone call, right? Because she she thinks she's entitled. I mean, this is uh, this is almost similar to Jim Crow, where um, where white men thought they were entitled to take a black man's life just because, and there was no there was no repercussion. And I think we're getting the same thing from our women. There's really no repercussion. I remember the time that uh, uh, I think you did the story a, a couple of years ago where uh, a man uh, came home and caught his wife cheating. Mm -hmm. He was packing his stuff to leave, and she shot him in the face. Yeah, last and summer. nothing happened to her. Yeah, there were actually two similar articles. I think one was in the mid Midwest, and one was in Florida, where uh, you know women were caught cheating, and um, and ended up assaulting, uh, if not killing, their spouses. Uh, the one you're talking about, I think the brother was actually in the hospital, uh, mm -hmm. suffering from gunshot wounds, and he said by the time he got out of the hospital, she mm -hmm. was free. And mm -hmm. out, right. So again, it, it, when we're talking about the various types of access, we talked about you know the middle class access without labor. We talked about wealth without capital. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked about uh, the the incentivization of, of of becoming a feminist and the benefits therein. But now we're talking about a lack of hypercarceral treatment. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not saying there should be. What I'm saying is when you don't have to worry, you know, how does it, what kind of behavior does it generate? And what kind of outlook the, does it create? And the black women are becoming the white men of the black community. Mm, you and Gigi, y'all don't, don't, don't say it. 
let's look at another one you guys familiar with this one here um this is a Roswell woman who pled guilty to fraud for stealing somewhere between six and seven million dollars in COVID relief funds. Hmm. Um, let me see. Uh, Hunter Van Pelt, which she changed her name to, 49 years old of Roswell, uh, pled guilty to submitting six fraudulent applications for the Paycheck Protection Program loans between April and June of 2020. Acting U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia, Kurt Erskine, said. Van Pelt used false financial records for multiple companies to secure more than six million dollars in PPP loans. Wow! Federal agents were able to seize about two million of the money Van Pelt received from the fraudulent loans. All right now, one of the things I noticed last year when some of the brothers were responding to my accusation that you know these programs ignored black male entrepreneurs to a great degree. Mm -hmm. Others were saying is some of them even had to find black women as the face of their companies just to be able to participate and get some of these loans. Right. But here we go. Now, right, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. Six to seven million dollars. Right. I'm just looking at different types. Now, here you go. This is an interesting one. All right. You can find this one on complex.com. This is a woman accused of molesting former student in her car. Mm. Right? Florida teacher was arrested Monday. Uh, I hate these little pop-ups. Right. Florida teacher was arrested Monday for alleging engaging in a sexual relationship with her former 14-year-old student earlier this year. Brittany Lopez Murray, 31 years old, a drama teacher at Halea Middle School in Miami, is accused of having sex with a student who is now in high school on several occasions while parked outside a small uh, a, a mall, a pharmacy, and other locations. The two also allegedly exchanged explicit text messages and photos, which were discovered by his sister this past weekend and shown to their father. Wow. While looking through his son's phone, the victim's father saw photos of Lopez Murray's exposed breasts and vagina. In addition wow. to conversations detailing their sexual encounters, Lopez Murray is facing a number of charges, including molestation, lewd, and l l lascivious, uh, lascivious battery engaging in a sexual act with a child, promoting sexual performance by a child, and unlawful use of a communications device. Um, there you go. And mind you, in 2017, she was Rookie Teacher of the Year <laughs> at the middle school. Because I'm sure the students loved her. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about. So you guys let me know what middle school teacher you've seen, what black male teacher at that is, uh, you know, Teacher of the year, having sex with 14 year old girls, and somehow still free, huh? Still free. You know, it's okay. But again, when you do find these men, again, how are they seen? Are they seen as individual cases or are they seen as a reflection on all black men? Do we oh, find yeah. ourselves as individuals being looked at differently when a brother is arrested for committing such a crime or even just accused of it? Do other black men that have nothing to do with it, are they noticing being treated differently? Or is it simply everybody just receives this as an individual? See, this woman here, Lopez Murphy, I don't know what she is, you know, racially. Um, right? I don't know what her 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 ethnic background is, but you know, she's in Miami, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah Cuban looks like. So if she's if, if she's Cuban, do all young Cuban teachers come into question because she did this? No. Yeah, I don't I don't really think so. Um I don't know. All right. Let's go to this one here. Oh, oh Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Let's do it. Let me see. Is this a... Let me make sure. Is that found? I found so many of these. Uh, shout out 77. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. This was... Uh, you can find this on local12.com. Mother allegedly punched daughter in the head, choked her at North College Hill home. Right? Cincinnati, mother is accused of choking and beating her daughter. Sierra Thomas allegedly punched her daughter in the head and choked her at their home. Um, the choking caused pronounced red marks on the daughter's neck um, and around her face and eyes. Uh, now, this was, you know, I think I've had this several times as a kid. So, um, <laughs> court documents say the daughter is unable to use it. it says, court documents say the daughter is unable to utilize her left arm as a result wow. of, of several surgeries and a stroke. Wow. So this is a whole nother level of it, right? And at the end of the day, this becomes the kind of thing 
that when now you, I can't remember what's the name of the football player who spanked his his child with a belt. Oh, belt. good lord! Um, I was asking. Uh, well, I'm asking the you know the comment section. In okay. General. Okay. But, you know the, again. Um, yeah. He just spanked him and got yeah he got he got uh, he got arrested for child yeah, abuse. Got arrested for child abuse, right? So again, you know, black men become the face of, of abuse, uh, be it to women or children, for that matter. Yeah, Adrian Peterson. Yeah, Adrian Peterson. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, let me see. I think I'll do. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip this one. And uh, let me see. Shout out to Keith and Blade Runner uh, and Xavier for putting the name up there. And again, I'm just popping through these. I'm not. I'm not going to these. To I'm not spending a lot of time on them. Here's another one: Fox17.com. Right? Tennessee woman breaks in, attacks ex-boyfriend, new girlfriend while they sleep. Right? Memphis, Tennessee. Tennessee police said a woman was arrested this week after breaking into her ex-boyfriend's house and attacking him and his new girlfriend with a knife while they wow. slept. Wow. India Foster, 21 years old, is charged with two counts of aggregated assault and aggregated uh, burglary. Um, police say back on July 30th, Foster broke into the boyfriend's home um, by forcing open a window and cutting a screen. The ex-boyfriend uh, told police he woke up to find Foster in his bedroom with a knife. He told police he and his girlfriend were cut multiple times. Wow. She was released from jail on a $5,000 bond. $5,000 for attempted murder. <laughs> That's under charge. You, you break in somebody's house with a knife and attack them, and they give you assault. Come on. See, but this is uh, how many black men get assault for something like that? Right? Now, what's again, my overall point here is there's a definitely a, a bifurcated kind of treatment in regard to behavior. This does not, you know, reflect on all black women to the degree that they're, they're not able to advance in terms of what the system provides. But it definitely serves as a point of contention. Um, <laughs> Uru, who said I'm trolling brothers with these mug shots? No, <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you don't have to worry that these kinds of, you know, uh, this kind of lack of uh, incarceral treatment is going to affect how all Black women proceed, when you don't have to worry that you will not have access to resources it's it's a very different thing black men often have to worry about black men they have no relationship with in any way simply because the perception of black men is treated as a group issue right it's treated as a group issue when it comes to what they are experiencing and how others may interpret you for something another black man did now i want to eh, hold on i think i'm missing one Bear with me one second, because uh, this one we got to talk about. Let's see where it went. Ah, oh, I see. All right. I think I accidentally deleted it, and we definitely need it. This is another angle of, of something that I think is important to deal with. Um, but I want to add to this. We don't forget. There it is. Hold on, let me bear with me for a second. Get rid of some of these. Yeah. Yeah, I think I accidentally hit a button earlier tonight and uh eh, forgot about it. Okay, so let me get through these. Da, da, da. <laughs> I apologize. I like to be more prepared than this, but I think I accidentally deleted this. Now this is one. That many of you guys saw. And I know because a lot of you guys, when I repo I posted this mm -hmm. on uh, my other social media, there were a lot of responses to this. So, you know, for, for those of you who can't see that, right, this was a, a little piece that was floating around social media. And I thought it, uh, you know, fairly quick to the point summary that we can delve into a little bit. Uh, it says XNFL WR or uh, Terrell Pryor. Flatlined twice after Shalia Briston stabbed him in the chest, mm. took her back, got her charges reduced, and then she served no jail time. Now he's going to jail for throwing pumpkins at her for not wanting to leave the club. And of course, you know, we had all kinds of opinions about this. Uh, and most agreed, most black men in particular, that, you know, this is essentially his fault for getting back with her. And it is what it is. 
I'm not mm-hmm. denying that. I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to excuse him. I'm not trying to make him out a victim. What I'm trying to say, um, yeah, he flatlined, right? What I'm trying to say is that we have to take what we've learned and actually apply it. We've talked before on this show about uh, the breeding of black men to prioritize overly so black women in relationships, the role they play in your life. We talked about, you know, this kind of... Appreciate that. Appreciate the support, Javon. Thank you. Um, said he dropped the link in the comment section for the Institute. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yo, right? this situation, I looked this up a little bit. So, yes, I think the first occurrence between them, she, uh, they were at a club. They got into an argument. Uh, she stabbed him several times. And then she and her girlfriends took him to the hospital. Mm. It is indeed that he flatlined a couple of times and the police noted that she and her girlfriends commented how they shouldn't have brought him to the hospital and just should have let him die. Mm. Wow. And not long after that, she actually punched and knocked out her own mother. Wow. And apparently in this latest incident, they were at a club yet again. He left the club. She refused to leave. He blew up her phone. Uh, she came back. They got into an argument. He threw, I think he slapped her and he threw pumpkins at her car and then he got arrested for it so this is a really (laughs) toxic relationship right but here's here's what i wanted to bring up about it how many of you guys um have experienced an argument right a tension a back and forth that doesn't become part of the story because i'm sure she was sitting down baking cookies and he walked in and just started throwing pumpkins at her right (laughs) What are you talking about? Right. So so what I'm talking about is, you know, in these kind of scenarios, the psychological abuse that tends to take place is generally not regarded. Right. What are the kinds of arguments? What are the kind of issues that that actually take place before something gets physical? Right. And my point in bringing this up is we have to actually begin to look at all of those dynamics. And this is the thing we talk about them all the time online. Brothers talk about the kind of discussions that go on under the table, kind of psychological abuse that can take place, you know, but it doesn't come up uh, when it comes to these kind of cases. And we have to be able to stand on the concepts that we're developing, right? We got to be able to stand on them because uh, at the end of the day, this is something we've all experienced to different degrees, right? I remember the first time an argument got out of hand enough to me for me to say, oh, this is how this shit happens. Huh. Okay. This is how people go off the off the rails. You know, at the end of the day, those kind of situations don't make the discussion. Right. If we look at the case I just uh, put up a little bit earlier, the young woman that broke into her ex-boyfriend, now mind you, ex-boyfriend's house and stabbed him and his new girl in their bed. What are the incidents? What are the discussions? What are the arguments? What are the threats that took place long before she actually did it? How many times do you guys hear those parts of the stories invoked when these situations actually go down? Even in the story I read, right? They tell you she broke in. They tell you she stabbed him. Did anything, any part of those stories point out the things that led up to that? And what recourse did he have? She may have threatened him. They had arguments. She's upset because they're not together. Where does he go? Right? Right. And if she hadn't stabbed somebody, if he actually defended himself, the story may have been flipped around to how he abused her. Mm. My point is simply that if we're going to talk about what we know as men who have had experiences that um, that don't necessarily make it into the newspapers, how do we or do we apply them to what we actually see taking place? Right. So, so yes, we can. We definitely need to say as men talking to one another, this brother was in a toxic relationship that he should have left a long time ago. Right. We definitely need to say that. We definitely need to hold each other accountable as far as that and make sure that we ourselves don't fall into that terrain. But at the same time, and we also have a conversation about the kinds of tensions that go on behind the scenes long before something has escalated to some being newspaper worthy. That's the question I want to ask. Yeah, she should have been a, she should have been put in a program a long time ago with a history of violence like that. Joseph, Joseph in the comments is absolutely right. That left picture of her is a mugshot from the night she stabbed him. She's mm-hmm. smiling. Is she in jail? 
Well, they, you know, he, no, normally, 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 once it attempted murder like that, they don't let you drop the charges. See that? Now you tell me though, if he had stabbed her several times to the point where she coded, yeah, where is he? He's in jail. He's not coming out. Yeah, he's going to prison, regardless of what she says. So when you line all of these things up, right? You line up the advantages we talked about, the incentives we talked about, the access to wealth and labor we talked, or what wealth and income without labor we talked about, and we add to that the cherry on the top of that is that you already know as a young woman that you are more than likely not going to ever have to worry about serious incarceration, right? What does that do? Well, this is why last year I introduced a concept that I called social gentrification. And it was more particularly entitled anti-Black misandric social gentrification, but that's a long way. I just called it ABM, social gentrification. And basically what I said was, what they are doing right now is creating a buffer class out of Black women. And this is creating a, a split, a schism in the Black community. And it has been doing so for the last number of years, the last five to six decades, in fact, at the very least, right? Creating this buffer class. And I mentioned several different points. I talked about the use of gender rights, reproduction, law enforcement, media, uh, entertainment, entrepreneurship, employment, education. I talked about all of these areas, right? As areas where we're seeing the gentrification of men. We're seeing men being downplayed, women being advanced. Well, tonight, we just added four more areas to that. So I can talk to you about 10 to 11 different ways that Black men and women's experiences have been split, have been made mm -hmm. divergent from one another, right. men overwhelmingly tamped down, women given access to the crystal stair. Yeah. All right. All right. This is That's essentially what we're talking about here. It's funny because in California, <laughs> there's a program called Crystal Stairs for uh, single exactly. mothers. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you, you know how I know it because because after my wife died, when I was trying to get my son into daycares, mm -hmm. um, I was of course charged full rate. I didn't even know it was otherwise until I listened and heard a couple of the mothers talking to each other, giving each other information about how to avoid certain types of bills and whatnot. And one of the things they talked mm -hmm. about was crystal stairs. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, this was kind of a, you know, this was kind of a network of mothers. Anybody, any single father that has mm -hmm. had a child in elementary school mm -hmm. or, you know, dealt with daycares or child mm -hmm. care, anyone, you're familiar with this kind of sorority of mothers mm -hmm. that engage one another. They're throwing birthday parties for each other. They're sharing information. When mm -hmm. you are a single father, you will start out at a position of not being welcome. Right. Not being welcome. Maybe if you're charming enough, you might be able to figure out how to get in in some kind of capacity. Trust me when I tell you, if this is a if this is a, a, a group of married women, it's that much harder. Mm -hmm. It will avoid you, you know, so as to not, you know, put forth the idea that. You see, I appreciate that, Jay. The uh, right hand of so white supremacy. <laughs> Can't saying, argue with that. I'm saying, it, you know, you find yourself on the outside of this sorority. And one of the things I remember them talking about was Crystal Stair. I'd never heard of it before, but it wasn't something anybody felt necessary to share because I was a male. I was a father. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? mm -hmm. so in that respect, yeah. You know, so again, when we talk about these areas, the divergence between black men's and women's lives is not accidental. It's not, it's not trivial. It's not arbitrary. It's actually very well intentioned. And it comes with material access and resources. And as much as we'd like to dismiss them and just, you know, be family together, it doesn't work like that. People prioritize eating over familyhood in many mm. instances. Mm. They do. Or advancement, I, I should say, right? Um, but I did promise you guys a number of solutions that I wanted to highlight. And knowing BGS, he might be... Sorry about that. He might be able to, to, to add to this, but there are at least four that I want to put on the table, right? Solution to the plan under development of black men. And these are beginning points. These are not exhausting, right? The first of which, take a mentor and a black male mentee. Learn and teach. If you are in a position to where you can learn from someone and teach someone that's uh, behind you, we need to do more of that. And notice I didn't say it necessarily had to be a black male mentor. I don't know what field you're in. I don't know what your projects you're engaged in. Take a mentor that can benefit you in some way, shape or form, but take a black male 
mentee, and I'm specifically talking to black men listening to this show, right? You want to talk about solutions? We have to build a network of resources and support for one another, which is why I was talking about when I talked about uh, prior and the abuse. He, it, instead of just dismissing him, we need to actually have a conversation about what we can do to support each other. And the first thing we need to do in my assessment is take a mentor, mentor and a black male mentee in some way, shape or form. Right. Second one, monetize key relationships and invest in black men. By monetizing, I simply mean we need to take it to the business level, right? We need to take it to the business level. Hire people. If you're going to hire anyone, look to hire black men, look to support each other, right? That's, I mean, these are very elementary level beginning points, but this is where it starts. Instead of dismissing each other, instead of, of ignoring each other, instead of uh, getting into beefs with each other, at some point, we have to be able to invest in each other. And I see that happening in, in some of these spaces online. It could happen more. It needs to. You know, too much of the time slandering each other online can bring about necessary likes and clicks and favorite but views. At some point, we got to invest, right, in each other. Uh, use your position to uplift like-minded Black men. Notice how if you have, uh, whether you're talking about whites or whether you're talking about black women, if they're looking to hire someone, do you notice who, who they tend to hire most? Each other. Notice that? Mm -hmm. Is that just my imagination? Mm -hmm. No, that's the way things are done. Uh, we we're just talking about uh, uh, the uh, the East Indians coming in, right? And into the into the uh, IT field, they hire, they hire each other. Right. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Do black men do that? No. We need to be. We need to do more of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you get also be in the position to hire, because a lot of times we have uh, we have what black female gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. well, but that's, that's another. Part, that's another show. <laughs> but but it's part of that. It's it's part of that buffer class, right? Mm -hmm. you know, part of the reason that you, you have a buffer class is to keep people away, to keep people mm -hmm. out, right? So, you know, uh, monetize key relationships, invest in black men, use your position to uplift like-minded black men. And last of which that I have up here, share opportunities with each other before anyone else. Mm. Why do I say that? Because when I happen to walk into spaces, and it could be on Facebook, it, it, it could be, hell, I've had it happen where I've walked in conversations happening in the hallway, especially between black women. They have no hesitation. To share resources with one another. Mm -hmm. Done. I think that's actually a useful tool. I mean, it used to be when we had an idea that there was a black community, you shared it with other black folk. But what I've been seeing in this last 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. is a primary focus on black women and black women. That's it. It's primarily them. And at the end of the day, this is definitely something black men need to do, do more of for one another. Right? We need to actually advance each other. We need to actually let e each other know about opportunities. I don't care if they're fellowships. Uh, uh, I don't care if they're programs. I don't care if they're job positions. You know, I don't care what it is. We have to become, and, and for the academics, and this is something um, uh, I agree with Dr. Curry on, we have to cite each other more. Mm. And I would say, if, even if you're not an academic, you know, we need to share each other's videos. We need to share each other's perspectives. Y'all should be mm -hmm. sharing uh, BGS's video from this morning. That should be, yes. you should be sharing that all over social media. You should be sharing Green Gorilla's, uh, you know, uh, recent shows, especially, you know, I'm not saying uh, recent as opposed to the older ones, but I'm saying you should be sharing them. You, you know, you should be sharing all the brothers that we're talking about. These videos should be shared, just like in the academic world, black men need to cite each other more. There's currency in citing each other. The ideas get out there faster, they're more prominent. People acknowledge them to a greater degree. We need to cite each other, you know, cite black male scholars more, uh, far more often. Uh, but at the end of the day, share opportunities and resources as well and, 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 and prioritize sharing them with other black males first. Right. Um, <laughs> you check out Uru. He said 0.5. Think twice before you automatically do things for women. Well, for free or at reduced price. <laughs> <Down there. laughs> right. 
<laughs> it be, don't don't be a cocky surf for the Ghana Protesto Network. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any thoughts about these, man? Anything you want to add? I mean, you, you know, uh, these should be a given. Uh, these should almost be like uh, the Four Commandments. This should be something we learn in as young as elementary school. You ever, you, you notice that? Yeah, these should be so basic that they're that they're that they're uh, what do you call it? Um, second nature uh you know that basically if you look at uh if you, if you if there's one thing to copy but uh, from our black women that we should adopt is networking right mm -hmm. because uh black mothers teach the little girls to network at two years old mm. Mm. pass on information from one to another at two years old they start very early appreciate that big mike uh Put that on the screen there. All right. Shout out to him. But yeah, no, they do. And that's something that I can definitely say. Black women uh, and even black feminists in the academy, they are really good at supporting one another. Right. Um, hiring each other for jobs, hiring each other for projects, sharing the resources, sharing, uh, you know, uh, job positions. Uh, it, it could even be fellowship opportunities. Oh, man. Yeah. And, and you know, if, and, you know, as far as uh, us content creators on YouTube, don't be afraid to uh, look up a, a professor scholarly work that you agree with and cite it. I mean, just by putting it out there, putting in a video, because most times um, I, I see papers that may get um, uh, a couple hundred people that will actually do it. Like Dr. Johnson, Dr. Johnson will tell you the reason that he's here is because I read his blog. And, <laughs> and it's a story. I mean, I mean, he's he's humble. He's humble, you know, so he'll laugh at it. He's he's humble. And I was looking at how often people read his blog, like maybe a couple hundred people. And I said, wait a minute, I have a larger channel that that my average video that I actually put up is like three or four thousand people. I can actually uh, increase his uh, number of people that actually uh, see his work by tenfold just by reading it on air. OK, so I just literally ripped, you know, literally just read his blog, his words on air and actually increase his, uh, his, 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 his presence, his notoriety, because he was just this little, not a little, I would say this unknown professor from Fresno that had a blog. OK, he's he's, he's not the great Dr. T that we have now. But thing is, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I you know I thought his work was brilliant. It was just unknown. It's just by the fact that I read it on air put it in a youtube video got his name out there we See, could do that for a lot of professors yeah and and, and i appreciate it. but he's not telling the full story what what initially happened is he said you know what doc you need to consider getting online and i was like man i'm not doing that i'm not getting online whatever so he didn't say nothing after that he was like okay so he waited till i wrote this piece and i had maybe 35 people read it <laughs> <laughs> And then he took the piece and he read it online on his show and 5,000 people heard it. And he just looked at me and was like, you know, he was just like, no, he didn't say nothing. He just was like, 5,000 people, Doc. I was like, God damn, mm -hmm. BGS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see you. So that's, you know, what, you know, he's right. And he was telling me that basically, and this is one of the things he said at that time, he said, people don't read. Um you got to actually, you know, communicate in a different, um, you know, genre. Now, I will say this. One of the reasons that I was doing the blog is I wanted people to have a static location to go to to find those uh, citations that I was using. And some of those citations, you know, disappear online, you know, magically. But, um, you know, I, that was that was the real reason I was doing it. I just wanted a static place that people could always come back to to find the articles or the talking points or the concepts I was creating. But I wasn't prepared to transition beyond that. And right. I'd say a year and a half later, um, I'm, I'm on my way. We're doing pretty well. I'm almost at 20,000 subscribers. So you guys can help me get there. I greatly appreciate it. But the point he's making is nonetheless uh, on point. We, we actually need to support people who are doing this work and try and push their work out there in ways that they themselves may not know right. how to do. Like like Tommy, the, if it wasn't for the Manosphere, uh, as brilliant as the book as the man not is, it would not have been halfway, not even a quarter known the way it is because the Manosphere actually got behind it and pushed it and actually, you know, put it in their videos, quoted from it, 
put uh, uh, put the book behind them in scenes so that they, it got exposed. So basically, the man not would not have been as accessible and as well known if it wasn't for the manuscript. Just by us talking about it here, putting it in our videos, quoting from Tommy, uh, Doctor Curry, and actually making this book famous. Well, I, I, I can't really say other than to say I know this. Um, uh, it's definitely well deserved. You know what I mean? The, the yes. book definitely stands on its own, but to have to have support from communities online like this is unprecedented, and it definitely uh, you know has an impact. So whether you're supporting people's videos, whether you're supporting their books, with their projects, the point is support. Mm -hmm. right? That that's the main point: support. And this and, and and this is one of the things we need to do uh, is in as many different venues as possible. Um, and I include the political. You know, you guys already know that we have the blackmail political agenda on my blog. That's I, I bring that up very intentionally because at the end of the day, uh, we need to be, we not only need to develop these elementary practices of supporting one another, we need to apply that politically and move to a point where we choose who to vote for based on whether those policies serve the interests of black men. And that's a conversation we need to have amongst ourselves about what those are. We don't see we haven't learned that when we were when many of us were coming up and I'm Gen Z, you guys know, we were told, uh, I mean, Gen, Gen X, excuse me, I'm Gen X. Um, we were told vote and vote left. That was it. Vote Democrat. That's it. You know, that's what we were told. We, we, and when we did have policies that were supposed to be, you know, black issues that were uh, went through the black caucus and whatnot, very rarely did anyone actually question whether these issues were relevant to black men we weren't taught how to do that many of us don't know how to do that now and at the end of the day that is a politic we have to develop so the black male political agenda is a starting point for that so that we can actually start to generate a whole different conversation about what black men need politically that goes beyond um just generic black politics that may or may not even apply to black men and i'm putting the link in the comment section so you guys can go there, check it out if you haven't seen it before, uh, and definitely, yet again, share it. Because mm -hmm. I didn't write it. It came from you guys. I just posted it. All of those policies on there are not a product of me just saying this is what should happen. They each came from Black men offering suggestions about what kind of policies would improve the quality of Black male life. And you guys just heard all night, you heard me go through all the areas where we are not only not able to 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 be prioritized but we are underdeveloped purposely right so we have to advance ourselves and this is a political list to get that conversation started so um there we go let me see eh, okay all right so some of the brothers are saying how much they learned about us through bgs through green gorilla um, very true. Um, and that's one of the reasons I like to have a brother on here because he also, uh, needs to be, you know, see the thing, my thing with BGS is he's actually produced a lot that, uh, people have used and don't credit him for. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons instead of me just talking about the video he made, I asked him if he'd come up. Appreciate that fear to none. Uh, uh, I want to Queen Khalila, how you doing, lady? Hope all is well. Um, <laughs> she said, on behalf of the Bailey family, poor black males, thank you for your voices. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, but that's one of the reasons I like to have BGS up here. It's it's because instead of just, you know, using his ideas, uh, credit the brother. You know, acknowledge it. This is where this is where the idea came from. If you're talking about the gynocracy, you need to shout out BGS, right? You know, and among other things. And that that's something I would apply to uh you know a, a lot of the content creators on here if you know who produced the concepts that you're using especially out of this space credit them credit them right bgs has seen his concepts used by content creators with thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers and they don't even, even acknowledge where the concept comes from and then later on he ends up having people uh, you know, coming back to him, introducing concepts as if he's never heard of them, and he's the one that created them. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Yeah. So, you know, acknowledge the people and give them, uh, give them the credit that's due. When they create concepts that have an impact on your life, 
you know, and that doesn't require, that doesn't even require any money. That just means when you say a concept, you know, cite who you got it from, mm-hmm. you know, cite who you got it from. Most particularly if it's the brothers in this space, they could use the attention, they could use the resources and their concepts could definitely use uh, being acknowledged in the right context. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jay, there are plenty of, uh, oh, you say YouTube shorts. Yeah. Shorts. yeah, yeah, we were just talking about, yeah, I mean, Doctor, we just talked about YouTube shorts as far as his content, yeah, as, as teasers. Uh, that's a whole nother thing I got to learn about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any closing thoughts, brother, before we check out of here? Uh, you know, basically, this is a, this is a good show. Those are those uh, that you see on the screen should be almost like Ten Commandments of uh, of the Black Manosphere. If you do nothing else, okay, because uh, it doesn't have to always have to happen uh, like we're in a hangout or even online. Uh, I always tell brothers get each other's emails. Uh, I, I uh, there's a brother that uh, there was a student uh, in um, I think it was a call I think a, a, a cybersecurity. I actually gave him some advice. I actually turned him on to a couple of people that could actually further his career. So that's what it's about. Uh, even if you can't do it yourself, you might know somebody that can. And the thing is to connect to people. I do that all the time where, you know, I might not know it. I am not might not be the expert, I, but I know experts. So I just connect those two people. So in other words, uh, um, a lot of times it, like, that, that's what you can do because you know people. You know people, uh, especially in, in, in this sphere. We, we trade emails. We talk to each other all the time. It's 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 easy to say, okay, this brother needs to learn something. This brother has an expertise. I'm just going to give you the brother's email, and it all that's all it takes sometimes. And I think we should do a lot of that, you know, by hooking each other up, uh, shouting each other out, like like he says, uh, monetize key relationships. Like uh, if you if you uh, like you, we have plenty of experts, if not only in computers but also uh, editing and in in video and in in you know, artwork, all that kind of stuff. Like a lot of my new artwork, I've gotten from subs. Mm. Okay, I've gotten from subs, just donating artwork to me. But they get recognition, and and uh, I hell, I get I get a free icon. So I mean, there's a lot of ways you can actually do things. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, all right. So I appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, shout, shout out to BGS for uh, coming up on here tonight. Uh, he's got a million yeah. things to do, so I appreciate it. And, um, and let's get let's get Doctor Twenty K. There's he's like two hundred short, and we got almost four hundred people watching or listening. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Let's get Doctor Twenty K. Appreciate it, much appreciate it. All right, y'all. Um, uh, y'all will see me on the other side. I hope you guys have a good night. Uh, let me. Take BGS down for a moment. All right. All right. So you guys have a good one. I appreciate your support. Please use these concepts. Talk about it. I want to hear your responses in the comments section. Other than that, peace. I am here to tell you, brothers, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unintelligent henchmen, valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic and selfish and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace.